Welcome to our Facebook Live, where UC Davis Mind Institute experts provide information about neurodevelopmental disabilities. Hi, everyone. I'm David Hessel. Today, we'll be talking about Fragile X in advance of Fragile X World Awareness Day. This Friday, July 22nd, we'll be learning about the genetic conditions related to Fragile X and the latest research from a group of uh, Mind Institute Fragile X experts. So I'm gonna start off by introducing myself. Again, I'm David Hessel. I'm a psychologist and clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And I'm on the faculty at the Mind Institute. I'm also a Fragile X researcher and I'm the director of the International Fragile X Premutation Registry. So joining me today are Rondi Hagerman, developmental behavioral pediatrician, distinguished professor of pediatrics at the Mind Institute, and she's the medical director there and an internationally recognized expert on Fragile X, as, as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, and then we have Angie John Thurman, associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and Laura Del Hoyo Soriano, who's a neuropsychologist and research scientist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences as well. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have questions today, you can post them in the comments and we'll answer them toward the end of the session. So we're just going to get this thing going right away and start with some basics. So uh, for viewers who might not be familiar with Fragile X, what is Fragile X syndrome? Um, why is it called Fragile X as well? And then later on, we'll get into what's uh, different about the premutation versus Fragile X syndrome. But for now, let's start with what is Fragile X syndrome? Hi, I'm going to answer that. Uh, so Fragile X syndrome is a genetic condition that actually is the most common inherited cause of intellectual disability. And it also is the most common single gene cause of autism. So it's a very important condition um, related to a mutation or a change in the fMR1 gene, which is on the bottom end of the X chromosome. So individuals with Fragile X syndrome usually present uh, in early childhood with developmental delay, sometimes behavior problems like hyperactivity, anxiety, some uh, repetitive motor movements like hand flapping. Uh, oftentimes they can be diagnosed with autism before the diagnosis of Fragile X syndrome. And that's why it's really important for anybody diagnosed with autism to have genetic testing that includes uh, looking at the Fragile X uh, or FMR1 gene, uh, because when you have Fragile X syndrome, there's an expansion of what we call a trinucleotide repeat, a CGG repetitive sequence in the ladder of the DNA. And when the CGG repeats more than 200 times, the gene turns off and there's an absence or deficiency of the Fragile X protein called FMRP. Now this protein, when it's missing, dysregulates a number of pathways, including many pathways involved with autism that isn't uh, Fragile X syndrome. So about one in uh, 5,000 individuals in the general population has Fragile X syndrome, and it affects both males and females although males are more significantly affected intellectually and behaviorally than most females because females have two X chromosomes. So the other X that doesn't have the mutation is making the protein FMRP. Great, so some people might be wondering why is it called Fragile X? Oh Could yeah, some... because when you have that extended CGG repeat, it makes the chromosome look like it's broken. There's a narrowing where the FMR1 gene is and it looks like it's fragile or getting ready to break off. And that's because of the DNA change. Um, and that's why I got the name Fragile X syndrome. In the past, you diagnose it by looking at the chromosomes and seeing the fragile site, but now there's a quicker and easier DNA test. So, 
Nowadays, after the gene was discovered in 1991, you just have to order a Fragile X DNA test and you'll find out the number of CGG repeats. And if there are 200 or more, that can lead to Fragile X syndrome. Okay, that's great. A great, nice summary from Dr. Hagerman. So what are some major areas of research going on now in, fragile, in the Fragile X field, especially in Fragile X syndrome? What are some major advances that have been made, let's say, over the past decade or so? And I think Dr. Thurman will get us going on that one. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so I think two things come to mind for me within the area of behavioral research. First, we've really seen the field come together and be a leader in highlighting the importance of outcome measures. And outcome measures are the different tools we use to measure changes in behaviors or different skills of interest. And so this is important because all our research and treatment studies are critically influenced by the tools we use to describe what we are measuring. And so we currently have a number of researchers and teams working very hard to make sure we understand when and for whom different tools work best and trying to work on identifying new tools or better tools in areas that we don't quite have the measurement ability we would like to. I think second, within behavioral research, we've really seen an increase in focusing on an in-depth understanding of the different features we see, and particularly on identifying the different factors that influence development or um, the appearance of different behaviors or skills. And this could be behavioral factors, environmental factors, biological factors. And this research is really important because it helps us identify the different ways we can potentially continue to support growth and learning across the lifespan. A really exciting uh, new development is the fact that there are now uh, a few different targeted treatments that can help to reverse or improve some of the cognitive and behavior problems associated with Fragile X. And I have to say the MIND Institute is a leader on this. We have several studies going on. And because of what Angie said about outcome measures, we're leaders in the outcome measures because of the work of Angie, Len Abadudo, and you, David. So we're really doing well in terms of new treatments for Fragile X. And that's why you have to get the diagnosis. So we're doing this um, program here to tell families and also doctors who you know, need to order the Fragile X DNA test more frequently. These are really exciting uh, pieces of news. You know, um, Fragile X is really a leader among all disorders of the brain in terms of translating, um, you know, treatments into tr clinical trials. Um, we are really at the forefront, not just at the mind is obviously, but our field in general is, is really making great progress. So this is great. Laura, do you want to add anything um, in response to that question? No, I'm more in the field of Angie. So I'm all about okay. what she said about, um, yeah. Excellent. That's fine. Okay, so I think one point of confusion sometimes is the difference between the Fragile X premutation and Fragile X syndrome. So you can have the premutation but not have Fragile X syndrome. Is that right? Yes. So as uh, Randy mentioned at the very beginning of, the, of this um, Facebook Live, people with Fragile X have more than uh, 200 CGG repeats, uh, which is many more than normals. So a person with 5 to 44 uh, CGG repeats in their FMR1 gene has a normal number of repeats. So they don't have Fragile X and they don't pass a, a higher chance of for having Fragile X to their children. 
So then we have people with 45 to 54 repeats. They still do not have fragile X and there are no risk for having children with fragile X. However, they might have a slightly higher chance of having some of the symptoms or uh, characteristics related to other fragile X associated conditions that you guys uh, will talk about later during this um, uh, talk. And my pass the slightly higher chance uh, of having these conditions to their children. So what happened with the premutation? People who have 55 to 200 repeats are said to have a premutation in the fmr win in the fmr1 gene sorry so they don't have fragile x but they might have or may later develop other uh, fragile x associated conditions in addition people with a premutation can have children with a premutation or a full mutation which is uh, fragile x however the chances of um, having a child with a premutation or a full mutation are kind of different for for women uh, with a premutation than uh, they are for men, for example, with a premutation. So for example, the number of repeats in the X cells of a woman with a premutation can increase uh, from the premutation range that we just talked about to the full mutation range, which is over uh, 200. And therefore a woman with a premutation can pass on a full mutation. And the more uh, CG repeats that a woman with a premutation has, the more likely uh, the, the child will inherit the FMR fmr1 gene uh, with a full mutation uh, and therefore have fragile x um, a man while with a premutation will pass on his premutation to his daughters uh, but not to his sons and a man with a premutation will not pass on a full mutation to any of his children uh, but a woman with each pregnancy uh, um, a woman with a premutation in one of our fmr1 um, genes has a 50 percent chance of having on either the premutation or the full mutation to her child, daughters or sons, and a 50% chance of not passing on either the premutation or the full mutation. Uh, so in summary, a full mutation is when uh, you have more than 200 repeats and then you have this full mutation and you develop or you have a fragile X syndrome. While if you have the permutation, again, this range goes from 55 to 200 and um, you don't necessarily have uh, the fragile X syndrome, but you can have some associated conditions that we will uh, later talk about. Yeah, so you can see how important research is because this is very complicated. Um, and I would say uh, it, one thing that's important to know is that this was recorded, so you could listen to that again. It was very detailed and thorough. Thank you, Laura. And also, I think we'll try to post um, some links to some, in, you know, some um, uh, material where you can review those uh, issues regarding transmission of the FMR1 mutation in um, there's a lot of uh, material written up about that. So it is complicated and thank you for taking us through it. So um, there are conditions associated with the premutation, some of which may not be present until later in someone's life. So those include fragile X associated tremor ataxia syndrome, uh, which was discovered uh, at the Mind Institute and Rodney Hagerman led that discovery um, amongst our team. So Dr. Hagerman, what is FAXTAS and who's affected by it? So, um, so FAXTAS is a neurodegenerative condition that can happen in older carriers. Now, when I say carriers, I mean individuals with the pre-mutation 55 to 200 CGG repeats. Now, what's important about the pre-mutation is that it's common. About one in 200 women in the general population can have the premutation and about one in 400 men have the premutation. So FAXTAS is the worst condition uh, of premutation carriers uh, because it's neurodegenerative. It usually begins with a tremor, a tremor when picking up something or when doing movement, that's called an intention tremor. And it also is associated with ataxia, which means problems with balance. Um, it is more common in males um, and uh, overall about 40% of older male carriers with the premutation can develop FAXTAS. 
Um, it also becomes more common with age. So in your 80s, it goes up to about 75%. So there's certain things you could do to maybe stall off or maybe alleviate fax tasks, uh, which is the short term for fragile X associated tremor ataxia. And that is um, you can avoid toxins in the environment. You can stop smoking. You can exercise every day, take antioxidants and lower your level of alcohol intake. Maybe no more than uh, one glass of wine a day if you're uh, having these neurological symptoms. Um, it can also cause cognitive decline and white matter disease and atrophy in the brain. So we have a program where we evaluate carriers who uh, could have fax tasks. Um, and that's one of our very important research studies. Um, so it can also occur in females, but it's less common in females. However, another uh, fragile X associated disorder uh, has to do with early menopause. It's called fax poi. And that means that women, about 20% of female carriers, develop menopause before age 40. And uh, another condition is called FAXAN, that stands for Fragile X Associated Neuropsychiatric Disorders, meaning depression and anxiety, which can occur uh, in about 50% of carriers. Uh, and it includes depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, chronic fatigue, and chronic pain. And these are common problems in uh, pre-mutation carriers, particularly women have uh, more difficulties with anxiety um, and sometimes with depression. So there are treatments for all of these problems. And because the pre-mutation is so common in the general population, we recommend uh, Fragile X DNA testing, particularly if there's a family history of Fragile X syndrome, and then uh, your doctor or geneticist or genetic counselor can explain more about the different types of Fragile X involvement in the family. Now, remember, only women can pass on the full mutation, as Laura said, to the next generation. So when we diagnose someone with either FAXPOI, FAXAND, or Fragile X syndrome, we look at the whole family tree. And it's really important to educate healthcare providers about the difference between the pre-mutation and the full mutation. Um, and that's another reason why we're doing this uh, Facebook Live program. All right, excellent. You covered the next question, Rondi. So we're going to move on. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I lead with Dr. Susan Rivera here at the Mind Institute. And that's a longitudinal study of carriers of the Fragile X premutation. So we want to try to understand what are the earliest signs of fax tasks, and we want to understand how fax tasks develops. Um, and so we have this longitudinal study where we enroll men who are Fragile X carriers and we follow them over time, over many years. And we do brain imaging, we do neuropsychological assessments, motor or neurological assessments. Um, we take blood samples to look at molecular markers and we try to really get a comprehensive picture of how the disease develops over time. And the reason that it's so important is, well, we want to develop treatments, of course, and some of those treatments might be uh, prophylactic. We might provide interventions before somebody develops fax tasks to help stall it or slow it down or perhaps prevent it. So in order to do that, we really need to know what to look for. And then we need to know what to measure over time to see if that progression is slowing or prevented. So this study is ongoing. And if you want to learn more about it, we'll post information um, in the chat. Uh, let's see. Um, there are a couple of discoveries that have come out of that project that I should probably mention. 
So in doing the brain imaging studies, we've learned um, that some of the changes in the brain occur much, much before anybody develops motor signs of Faxtas, uh, perhaps even decades earlier. So we know that something is sort of percolating in the brain ahead of time. And we've identified some pretty specific brain measures that seem to be sensitive to the changes that occurred during fax tasks. So that's one, one exciting advance. And another is from the neuropsychological side, we can actually see some slowing of movement um, and some uh, weaknesses in dexterity or the ability of the person to use their hands to perform tasks that seem to um, change before the more obvious signs of fax tasks develop. We're also measuring things like gait. So a person can walk on a mat that um, carefully records uh, their steps and how wide apart their steps are and the kind of cadence of their walks. And those seem to be potentially early, early indicators of changes of gait or balance. So those are some, some exciting things that are happening in that project. Okay, so we're discussing Fragile X and its related conditions today, ahead of Fragile X World Awareness Day, um, which is on Friday. So I'm joined by Mind Institute experts, Fragile X experts, Rondi Hagerman, Angie John Thurman, and Laura Del Hoyo Soriano. So again, if you have questions, please post them in the comments and we'll address them at the end of the discussion. So moving on, uh, another condition that can affect premutation carriers is primary ovarian insufficiency or FAXPOI, P-O-I, which affects women, of course, and it can impact their fertility. So what are some, well, maybe um, Dr. Hagerman could describe a little bit more of what, about what FAXPOI is, and then she could tell us what kinds of options there are for women who are premutation carriers. So FAXPOI again means menopause or at least stopping of your periods before age 40. It occurs in about 20% of women with the premutation. And what's very interesting is there's a certain range of premutation numbers uh, between about uh, 75 to 90 repeats in the front end of this FMR1 gene that is associated with more frequent development of FAXPOI. Uh, so someone with 120 repeats, so that's on the high end of the premutation range, is less likely to develop FAXPOI. So we don't quite know the reasons for this, but when it does occur, um, uh, you can measure certain hormonal levels uh, like FSH that's increased. Um, this is a problem because uh, many women, um, you know, can develop uh, FAXPOI even in their 20s and early 30s, uh, so very young. So if they're in the range of higher risk for FAXPOI, they may want to uh, extract eggs and store them. And it's more likely to occur when there's a family history of early menopause. Um, there are treatments, uh, so when you go through menopause, hormonal treatments can be very helpful. Uh, Faxpoi can also be associated with more psychiatric symptoms, and there's treatment for those psychiatric symptoms also. I also want to mention that um, our study in the genotype phenotype um, program where we study individuals with fax tests, we find that there are symptoms that um, uh, progress more rapidly in females compared to males. As I mentioned, females have um, fewer motor symptoms and less white matter disease in their brain, but they actually have higher rates of um, uh, anxiety um, and some of the psychiatric symptoms and also pain symptoms. So females are more sensitive to pain symptoms um, but these uh, pain symptoms and also psychiatric problems can be treated early. So um, we don't know yet about whether 
treating psychiatric problems even before the onset of facts tests can be prophylactically or help to uh, stave off the uh, symptoms of facts tests. But we know, do know that psychiatric problems like anxiety and depression, depression can shrink the brain and we don't want that. So we want to treat, uh, recognize and treat these psychiatric symptoms early on. Um, well before the onset of fax test. Um, so um, we published about the psychiatric symptom progression and the pain problems uh, in a paper this year um, uh, by Devin Johnson is the first author. Um, and maybe we can put that in the um, uh, uh, materials related to this uh, um, uh, program. So uh, it's really important to recognize the problems that pre-mutation carriers can have and then treat them early on. Okay, excellent, thank you. So I'd love for everybody um, who's participating to weigh in on what you think are the most promising studies being done right now. That could be treatment studies, the understanding of fragile X conditions, or testing. Um, so what do you think is the most exciting stuff going on in, free, in research? I can start that. I know some of the things I'm really excited that we're shifting to uh, involve the calls and efforts researchers are putting in behavioral science to focusing on females with fragile X syndrome, which is a much needed area um, of understanding as well as on the transition into adulthood. So both of these are critical next steps for our field and areas where we don't have as much uh, research that we would like to have. And these studies, um, as they continue to grow, will help us more accurately describe the experiences and needs and families and what we can do as a field to help support, um, support everyone. In addition, we've seen more clinical trials start to combine treatment approaches. So this can be um, combining different behavioral treatment approaches or combining medications with behavioral treatments. And these multimodal strategies, I'm very hopeful, will be um, a critical next step for the field. I'm okay, really about excited about targeted treatments. <laughs> that when I say targeted treatments, I mean treatments that could reverse the neurobiological abnormalities. And as Angie mentioned, it's also good to have the educational and language and other types of interventions. But in terms of uh, new treatments for fragile X syndrome, I'm excited about preliminary data regarding uh, metformin, a topical CBD preparation, uh, had very positive preliminary results, and also a new medication that can elevate the cyclic AMP levels, which helps neurons connect. And uh, this has shown some improvements in cognition, uh, particularly with David Hessel's toolbox, a new way of measuring cognition uh, on a more regular basis in individuals with Fragile X syndrome. And we're excited about some new treatments that I think we hope to get started in FACS tasks. Um, and um, hopefully they'll start at the end of this year or maybe next year, um, because we'd really like to, um, you know, reverse or cure these conditions. And also some exciting new um, uh, gene therapy studies are going on in animals and many other neurodevelopmental disorders, and that will impact Fragile X uh, probably in the next two to three years. So these are all very exciting. Yeah, this is wonderful to hear. I think the other, if I could just add, the other thing that's exciting is an effort to really um, harmonize uh, or make consistent the ways that we measure um, either behavior or brain changes in animal models and humans with fragile X syndrome. So many people will, will remember that the fragile X knockout mouse was used um, for many, many years to help us understand fragile X syndrome. And in fact, that 
uh, mouse model led to um, the uh, investigation of many targeted treatments to see if they could be helpful for people with fragile X. But then when we took some of those um, interventions into human studies, there was kind of much more mixed results. And that could have to do with the way we translate the um, findings in the mouse model to people. And so there's some efforts going on now that are very exciting to try to look for um, very close parallels in measurements in animal models and humans with fragile X. And I think that's gonna be real helpful um, in the next decade or so. And okay. I also, sorry, and I also want to yeah. add something very brief and okay. is uh, regarding the outcome measures. Uh, also in the United States, the second most speaking language is Spanish. So in our lab, we're mm -hmm. also working on having this uh, cognitive language and behavioral outcome measures available in Spanish. So we can have a more representative sample in our studies and all those participants who are Spanish speakers can also uh, participate. So we can also track uh, those changes in language and cognition over time when they are in a clinical trial or in a behavioral intervention. That is hugely important. Thanks for adding that. Um, okay, so uh, why is it important that we continue to build awareness for Fragile X? After all, Friday is Fragile X World Awareness Day. So why should we make everybody be aware of Fragile X? So as Randy mentioned, Fragile X syndrome is the most common monogenetic cause of inherited intellectual disability and also uh, of autistic symptoms or characteristics. So that's one of the main reasons why we need to uh, bring awareness on that because it's not uncommon at all. And again, a lot of uh, people has the premutation, especially women uh, who can pass to their children. So um, for this reason is very important and we need to increase the general knowledge of fragile and permutation in our society. Um, we also need to increase the knowledge of pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions that are available for fragile X and related conditions. And most importantly, we need to transfer that knowledge to healthcare providers and also to educators um, because our ultimate goal as researchers is to improve the quality of life of people with uh, fragile X and related conditions. So by improving the knowledge in everyone that is treating or that is working with these people, uh, we can make an impact. So um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that everyone else here wants to add something on that. Um, what's, so what's the role of the genetic counselor in these families? So the genetic counselor will show how the gene mutation changes through the generations. So in every family where we find one individual affected by either the full mutation or the pre-mutation, there will be multiple other individuals impacted by this mutation, far more than you would ever expect. So that is critically important. The genetic counseling, knowing how it's passed on, testing other family members who are at risk and giving treatment to those that have fragile X syndrome or pre-mutation involvement. And that's why we need doctors to do the test, to order the fragile X DNA test. It's done by multiple labs around the world. Most university labs do it. Just when you see patients that have ovarian problems or tremor and balance problems or intellectual disability, and you don't know the cause or autism, you have to order a Fragile X DNA test and you have to know the difference between the pre-mutation and the full mutation. So it's really important to get that message out to healthcare providers. And most of the time the families can educate their healthcare providers and tell them to order okay, this so, test. <laughs> thank you. So I think um, in the interest of time and the listeners, we're gonna move on to audience questions so that we have enough time to answer them. So um, I'm gonna go ahead with the first one and forgive me because I have to change my screen here to see them. Um, so are females with the pre and full mutation also at the same risk as carriers for FAXPOI or FAXTAS? So individuals with the full mutation will not get 
uh, fax tasks or fax poi, okay? That, those are pre-mutation disorders. But the pre-mutation is very common in the general population. You know, one in 200, one in 400. Most individuals who have the pre-mutation don't know they have it. And often it's the OBGYN doctor who has seen someone for ovarian irregularities who makes the diagnosis. And then subsequently, oftentimes, you know, uh, a parent or grandparent can be diagnosed with uh, fax tasks or a, a child who maybe was diagnosed with autism can then be diagnosed with fragile X syndrome. Okay, another question coming in is, will metformin be good preventative medication? Dr. Hagerman, what do you think of that? So metformin uh, helps to prevent a number of problems, including cancer, um, uh, cerebrovascular disease with aging because it lowers blood sugar. We don't know if it can prevent fax tasks. Uh, likely not. It can treat Fragile X syndrome, it's a targeted treatment for some of the symptoms of Fragile X syndrome, but we don't know if it will prevent FAXPOI, although it can stimulate folliculogenesis or more follicles in females, um, but we don't know if it can prevent um, FAXTAS either. So these studies have to be done. Okay, there's a great question, interesting question about gene therapy. So could you tell us about CRISPR gene therapy? Who wants to take that one? Probably Dr. Hockerman, I'm assuming. Yeah, so we're very excited about CRISPR, Cas9, and other possibilities for gene or molecular interventions. I mean, it may be possible in the future to give the Fragile X protein um, and inject it into the spinal fluid and get it into the brain. It may be possible using CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the gene in uh, some of the cells and get rid of the excess CGG repeats and inject that into the spinal fluid and get it into the brain. Um, but other sorts of uh, uh, interventions like oligos that can lower the amount of messenger RNA, which is too high in carriers, and that's what causes some of the RNA toxicity leading to FAXPOI and FAXTAS and FAXAN. May, it may be possible to lower that with uh, special molecules called oligos uh, that could lower messenger RNA levels. So we're interested in any type of molecular gene therapy or stem cell therapy intervention in Fragile X. Uh, but it has to be studied in animal models first and shown to be safe before it can be started in human trials. And that'll take a few years. Okay, great. So here's a wonderful question, a really important and common question. I'm a mom of two young adults with Fragile X and many times it's difficult to find the right treatment because our primary care physicians do not have much information about this condition. So what, inf what advice can you give us to be able to find adequate treatment for many of these symptoms that we feel, such as depression, anxiety, memory loss, and so on? And I would say, I'm not clear whether the question is directed for you know, treatment of her sons or young adults with Fragile X or her own symptoms, but I can say that in, in terms of the pre-mutation and being a carrier and experiencing anxiety and depression, you know, it's really important to get um, uh, expert advice and assessment and treatment for that anxiety and depression, just as if uh, you would for somebody without the pre-mutation. So there's no really specific uh, treatment for anxiety and depression in Fragile X, there are medications that are quite helpful to treat anxiety and depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy is definitely a kind of a first line um, intervention for anxiety and depression as well for carriers. And I would say one other thing to add is try to find a provider who is willing to learn about Fragile X and your experience of being a carrier and a mother of um, 
uh, children with fragile X syndrome. I think it's really, really important for them to understand that perspective. So I'll see if anyone else wants to chime in on that, on that particular question. Yes, I do. Uh, there has been a lot written, papers and books. Uh, our latest book from 2020 uh, from McGraw-Hill about treatment of fragile X and associated disorders. The National Fragile X Foundation website at fragilex.org has sections, whole sections about treatment of fragile X syndrome. So I can send you many papers about this. Uh, you can email me at rjhagerman, H-A-G-E-R-M-A-N, at ucdavis.edu, but a ton has been written. So the best thing to do is take these papers to your primary care physician and this person can order these things. I also wanna mention for both uh, pre-mutation and full mutation involvement, a really great treatment of depression is exercise. So if you're a pre-mutation carrier and having depression or anxiety, you got to get out there and exercise every day. And we also think that antioxidants could be helpful for some pre-mutation disorders, although they, we still have to do control trials on them. But there's a variety of interventions that can be helpful, stopping smoking, stopping drinking, exercise every day, treating the psychiatric problems as David uh, mentioned. So lots have been written about treatment for both pre-mutation disorders and for fragile X syndrome. So you gotta get your whole group of therapists, psychologists, uh, you know, uh, OT, speech and language therapists, special education people. It takes a whole team approach for treatment of fragile X syndrome besides the medications. Okay, good. So another question, uh, I have a genetic issue or another genetic marker gene that prevents my body from accepting folic acid. And the person wonders if that's a fragile X thing for carriers. No, it's not a fragile X thing. It's a separate mutation. Okay. Uh, why is it still that medical people, uh, professionals still don't want, still don't, I guess, still don't know what fragile X syndrome is. And also why do they dismiss carriers who are having problems? Great question. Yeah. So a lot of physicians say, you know, having depression or anxiety is relating to raising a child with fragile X syndrome. Given that's tough to raise kids with fragile X syndrome, but that's not the only cause of the psychiatric symptoms. It's also intrinsic uh, in the gene mutation itself. So that's why we named FAXPOI and FAXAN and FAXTAS to show that these conditions are real and physicians have to pay attention but sometimes physicians are older and haven't been taught this in medical school because you know the gene was just discovered in 1991 and it's only in the last decade or so that we're much more knowledgeable about pre-mutation conditions. So physicians sometimes confuse fragile X syndrome with pre-mutation disorders. So you have to explain the difference and bring them papers because physicians deal with a lot of stuff and you know only a small percentage of their patients can have this mutation. So you have to bring them educational articles and papers to educate them or have them listen to this Facebook uh, program. <laughs> okay, let's take maybe one or two more questions because uh, we're at about 45 minutes now. Um, so can full mutation females get fax tasks? That's a good question. It actually came up as a point of discussion at the International Fragile X meeting in San Diego. Um, so who would like to address that? No, in general, they can't. I mean, there may be a rare individual that has elevated messenger RNA, but uh, basically full mutation individuals do not get fax tasks. 
Okay, that's the last question. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, does anybody want to add any further comments? Yes, I want. I want to say that here at the Mine Institute, we have the Resource Center, and that's a very nice uh, place where families can share their opinions, their state, and we have families uh, with autism, we, th we have families with fragile X, we have uh, families with Down syndrome, and we have uh, educational talks too, uh, so they can, uh, that are all, all given um, via online. We have these talks in English, but also in Spanish, and they can go into the website of the Mine Institute, and they can, you know, um, take a look there and uh, uh, give their email address so they are informed of when these talks are happening. And this is also a great place uh, to share with other families that are in the same situation and also having experts uh, talking about different topics and learning and also bringing them uh, that knowledge to your primary care physician if needed. So, yes, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I wanted to add that we also have an international training program for neurodevelopmental disorders and people come from all over the world to train here in autism, fragile X syndrome, pre-mutation disorders. So our, the, the research that we do here gets disseminated internationally as these uh, physicians and therapists go home. And you can also read more. There's two foundations associated with Fragile X Syndrome, um, the National Fragile X Foundation. So FragileX.org has over 200 patients, uh, pages uh, on their website about treatment. And also the Fraxa Foundation at, I think it's Fraxa.org has information about Fragile X Syndrome too. And both uh, um, uh, both uh, foundations uh, support, research, and educate professionals. So there's a lot you can read on the web. I would uh, um, restrict it to those two um, really great foundations um, uh, to get um, really important information. All right, this is great. So thank you, Laura and Rondi and Angie for being with us today and answering all these questions. We really appreciate this. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.